And good afternoon to you all. I'm incredibly, uh, incredibly grateful that you did not all get up and leave as I walked up to the podium. Uh, I promise to try to make this interesting so you will not be thinking about the food that Mark keeps talking about that they're going to be serving us after Madame Kathleen Savelle receives the Affiliate Teaching Award. I think it's fitting that I'm giving this address after so many brilliant student lectures, uh, which were very fascinating, and I'm going to try to stay away from obtuse, jargon-laden prose so often used by uh, scholars in the field of literature. I'm extremely humbled to receive the Nakbar Award for Outstanding Achievement in Scholarship by a faculty member in the humanities. It is meaningful to me that several of my colleagues in the humanities chose me to be, little old me, to be this year's recipient of the Nakbar Award. I never met Bernard Nakbar, even though he passed away five years after I arrived at Loyola. I don't know how that could be. I suppose that was because he was busy, busy running one of Loyola's first study abroad programs at Catholic University in Belgium. But I do feel like I know him because I have benefited from the center of the humanities, which he founded, and from the bits and pieces of his wisdom that float around in conversations and on pages in the internet, which I was very fortunate to find. One thought of his goes like this, and I quote, teaching is to make room for wonder, to destroy what is taken for granted in search of truth, to lead from the known to the unknown. I will try to adhere to this advice as I proceed with my address to you today regarding how social class can overwhelm nations of race and gender. Since my talk is about the life of the mind, I have to add the subtext of bilingualism because that was an important thing that happened to me along the way of my life. Uh, this is the first time I ever used PowerPoint in a lecture. <laughs> uh, in 1973, I found myself in Spain, an arrogant 19-year-old. I knew everything. And as I recounted in my 1980 book, Pumping Images, there was an argument, and a Spaniard asked me, Por qué matáis a los vietnamitas? Why are you killing those Vietnamese? And um, I didn't really know what to say. And um, I stupidly responded to get rid of the commies. And uh, the Spaniard offered the repost. So if someone thinks differently about economics than you do, you should kill them. And I immediately got the logic of that. <laughs> and um, it was a big moment in my life. I remember it to this day. And um, it kind of, in a way, blew up my brain into fragments that I can now rearrange as I assimilate new knowledge into this labyrinth we call life. This basic questioning logic paradigm free from political ideology evolved in my mind until I came up with a paradigm of decolonial reasoning. Decolonial reasoning can be helpful to understand organizations like Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street, but it can also serve in the study of Latin American literature especially during the Renaissance when the conquest happened. This is because it was colonialism that reorganized life here in the Americas. I have developed this kind of reasoning into a theory, a decolonial theory, and published a book which Dr. Austin mentioned which features four different varieties of decolonial reasoning which I applied to five different authors. The book, Decolonial Indigeneity, was published by Lexington Books in 2017. Fortuitously, it was just released this week in paperback, so I was very happy to see that. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, a bilingual author, an early 17th century historian. He was from Cusco, Peru, the seat of the Inca Empire, and ended up living in Cordoba, Spain. He changed his name a few times, but the last and most symbolic version of his name was Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. Who was Inca Garcilaso de la Vega? Well, he died in 1616, like two, these other two fellows that you may have heard of, Miguel de Cervantes and William Shakespeare. Now we come to the race part. Um, the race part is interesting because 
Um, we didn't really use the word race in the 16th century. What I found in Spanish, the word that's usually used are, is na nation or naciones. Um, so I'm using a term that wouldn't have been used at the time, but I'm using it because if I was talking about nations, you would think about the United Nations. Garcilaso was the son of a Spaniard, Sebastián Garcilaso de la Vega, and the daughter of an Inca princess, Isabel Chimpu Oclo. He was the first Peruvian to say, I am mestizo, which means I am half and half. He was of both worlds, the Spanish and the Incan, but he was of neither. This, uh, thus, he is a remarkably interesting historical subject when we try to understand the concept of nation, what a nation is. I have studied him and other mestizo chroniclers of the 16th and early 17th century in my new book, which as I yelled out from the audience, it's going to be out in a few weeks. Um, in chapter three of the book, um, I studied the relationship of Garcilaso, the relationship in Garcilaso between language and nation. Language is important to the notion of the nation, and in the Andes there were hundreds of languages being spoken, and many of the language groups considered themselves to be nations. The Inca Cuna, or Incas, you might say, in English were a nation, but they were in the 13th and 14th centuries a very powerful nation, and they conquered many other nations surrounding Cusco. Some of these nations you've probably never heard of, Canas, Canchis, Coyas, Lucas, Pancajas, Caracas, Quica, Asanqui, and the Charca Confederation. Those nations stretched all the way from what is today southern Colombia all the way down to Tucumán in Argentina and uh, Chile. Uh, those conquered nations uh, were all brought into the Inca fold. And as subordinated nations, they had to submit to Inca rule. And this is kind of interesting because we talk about people such as these as Indians, but if you call them an Indian, you're not really saying anything about them because they had very complicated relationships. Garcia Lasso was born in the midst of what I like to call the 40 Years War. It was defined by civil wars among the Inca Cuna, wars between the Inca Cuna and other ethnic nations, wars between Inca Cuna and Spanish, Spanish people, and the Spanish Civil Wars in Peru. The period ran from 1532 with Francisco Pizarro's execution of the Inca King Atahualpa and the execution of the last Inca sovereign, Tupac Amaru, the I in 1572. Garcilaso was born in 1539, and he grew up in the midst of all those, all those conflicts. As I mentioned, Garcilaso's father was Sebastián Garcilaso de la Vega. His mother was Isabel Chimpu Oclo. He spoke Spanish in the public sphere, and he spoke Quechua when he was home with his mom. Yet this was not some kind of clear-cut duality that informs his thinking because the views on one side reach in and touch the views on the other side. The bicultural and hybrid cultures that arrived were an object of colonial scrutiny. The Bourbon Viceroy Manuel Amat commissioned scientific, commissioned scientific paintings that show the varieties of admixture between types that we would call today racial. This is not surprising that there would be interest in this because even if you look in architecture, I took this picture in Cusco. Uh, this is the uh, Iglesia of uh, Santo Domingo, the Santo Domingo Church, and it's built on Cori Cancha Foundation. So you have a level of Inca architecture. You can see the bricks from the Inca architecture were used to build the church. So you have actually hybridity in the very architecture, if you walk through Cusco, which was the capital of, of the Inca Empire, many of the buildings have the two types of foundations. Garcilaso speaks a beautiful Renaissance Spanish, 
but he retains pre-conquest views of his fellow Indians who were subjected to the Inca Cuna. His view of Andean nations was as a pre-contact Inca. That is to say, they were colonialist in a pre-Hispanic sense, but he lived in a Hispanic society that considered him to be a colonial subject. Thus, we have coloniality superimposed over coloniality. In the formation of Latin American nations, I discuss how Garcilaso viewed non-Inca people through an Incan lens. He viewed non-Incan people as barbarians who needed to be civilized through the transmission of Quechua. In his great book, The Royal Commentaries of the Incas, from 1606, he writes, it makes them sharper of mind and more docile and more able to learn whatever it is that they want to learn. From barbarians, they are turned into men who are more political and urbane. The Royal Commentaries of the Incas are an excellent text for getting to the ideas that show that coloniality of the Inca Cuna over other Andean people, while at the same time, the second half of the book, The General History of Peru, is great for understanding how the coloniality of Spaniards over Andean people got into Garcilaso's brain. This brings us back to the question, how does class overwhelm race in Inca Garcilaso? Non-Inca Cuna are classified as barbarians. If Garcilaso had a concept of race, he might have defended all Andeans against the Spanish. Instead, his Inca class overwhelmed any notion of pan-Andean solidarity. And this brings us to the question, how does class overwhelm gender in Inca Garcilaso? Garcilaso chose to write his great book in Spanish, not in Quechua. And thus, he wrote in his father's language, but not in his mother's. Indeed, he was exiled out of Peru. All those people with Inca blood were very dangerous, and he ended up in Cordoba in Spain. People argue if it was exile or self-exile, we don't know. In Spain, he hung out with linguists, such as Bernardo Aldrete, canon of the Cathedral of Cordoba, and the author of the 1606 book, uh, on the origin and principles, no, on the origin and beginning of the Spanish language, which was published in Rome. Why do I say that class overwhelms race or nationality? Because Garcilaso was interested in maintaining privilege of the Inca class over the class of everyday Indians, a term he sometimes used. This way, the Inca Cuna could maintain royal privilege even during the colonial interval. If you are interested in Garcilaso de la Vega, he has three books of original scholarship. In the end, my thesis that bilingualism breeds a more open mind, as I feel it did with my basic question about the Vietnamese in 1973, even in the end, I think I'm proving that my thesis is wrong. <laughs> which is very upsetting to me. <laughs> so um, what I would like to say about it is that the thesis, is, uh, the thesis of decolonial theory may be true in some cases, but not in all cases, and certainly not true with Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. I believe this has to do with the powerful influence of class over race and gender. If I had had more time, I would have showed you that neither was it the case with Clorinda Mato de Turner, a 19th century uh, scholar, novelist, essayist, who falls into the same category. In 2004, I published this book in Lima. Um, I guess the title would be Cultural Resistance. And in it, I started to explore how Inca Garcilaso's influence could be felt in the 19th century intellectual Clorinda Mato de Turner. But I'm not done with this topic. I published an article on my research on the 19th century and early 20th centuries at the Americas Society in New York, but it doesn't end there. My very next book will delve deeper into Inca Garcilaso and into the manner in which 12 different 19th century authors received him and what he means for the nation in terms of race, in terms of gender and of class. I try to decolonize the coloniality of his mind 
And in doing so, I try to decolonize the coloniality of my mind, decolonizing the coloniality of his mind. <laughs> I hope you find my research topic interesting. If you do, you can look forward to my next book. <laughs> and I hope you will see the value of asking that very basic question, free of politics, to get down underneath the concepts, stereotypes, and biases that we have to understand the order of the world. Thank you for your interest, and thank you for not getting up to leave while I was talking. <laughs> <laughs>